In this video, I would like to share an adapted version of an assignment that I completed as part of my PhD studies at Queen's University. I focus on the information that we have so far surrounding the implications of the ongoing insolvency proceedings at Laurentian University on provincial educational issues. Before we get started, I would like to be extremely clear that the views in this video are my own. They do not represent my employer or any of the institutions that I'm involved with. I am a first year PhD in nursing student at Queen's University, and I also have some experience teaching in the post-secondary uh, sector. I have not used any insider knowledge in this presentation, and I am not in consultation with anyone employed at, Uni at Laurentian University about this issue. Everything that's in this presentation is informed by information that I have found publicly online. Um, information that is publicly available sometimes conflicts and is incomplete. Due to conflicting reports over the events that have transpired, there may be some errors in this presentation. This, present, this situation story is also rapidly evolving and any feedback that you have for me on the presentation is of course welcome as I continue to examine this issue as part of my class. It is well known that Laurentian is in crisis and there are profound human impacts on students and the community. This graphic represents how an artist in the area was feeling on the day that the program and faculty cuts were announced. Faculty across the institution are grieving and students are left with fewer options for education and, as this one tweet indicates, some cannot simply relocate. Although the current crisis appears to be isolated to Laurentian University, these proceedings have far-reaching effects on the post-secondary education landscape. For the first time in history, one institution, Laurentian University, has filed for creditor protection and citizens are blaming the government for its inaction to prevent such a devastating situation for the city of Sudbury. The one thing that citizens, students, former faculty, and former Board of Governors seem to agree on is that what has happened at Laurentian University can happen at any institution. In particular, smaller sized institutions appear to be at the most risk. According to an article in the Sudbury Star, comparable universities include Algoma, Nipissing, OCAD, Trent, Lakehead, Ontario Tech, Brock, Windsor, and Laurier. It is clear that debt became an issue for Laurentian University. According to former Board of Governors from Laurentian University, the debt at, La at Laurentian University was actually below the median of this comparator group. Laurentian University has been struggling financially since at least 2014, reporting deficits every year since long before the pandemic. Members of the community are shocked, claiming that a lack of transparency contributed to the issue. Former administrators blame funding changes. Faculty blame mismanagement, and politicians blame the Ontario government for not intervening earlier. An analysis of the causes of the problem, which will be provided shortly, highlights that what is happening right now at Laurentian can happen at other institutions. In February of 2021, Laurentian University was unable to make payroll and a dangerous precedent was set for academic institutions. Instead of using the process embedded in their collective agreement to manage the situation, Laurentian University opted to declare insolvency and invoke the company's creditors arrangement act. During this process, deep cuts were made, including the loss of over 190 jobs and nearly 70 programs. These numbers are from the affidavit from Robert Hache, Laurentian's current president, and are actually higher than what's reported in some of the media reports. The company's Creditors Arrangement Act was not designed for use with publicly funded post-secondary institutions and has since sparked political controversy. One major concern is a lack of publicly available information justifying the job and program cuts. Sudbarians are left asking why essential programs like midwifery were terminated. The midwifery program at Laurentian University closed, even though many claim that it cost the university nothing to run. As the College of Midwives indicates, this program served communities outside of the region. It is one of six in North America and the only such program in Northern Ontario. The president of Laurentian University, Robert Hache, swore in his affidavit that it was closed because it was expensive, had an imposed annual in 
a uh, cap of 30 students across both the French and English programs, and provincial funding was insufficient and unpredictable. The overarching impacts on healthcare are still unknown, as Laurentian University has close ties with the only hospital in the area. Radiation therapy, midwifery, and nursing have already suffered. Laurentian University has a tricultural mandate, but the cuts to the French and Indigenous programs have left former faculty questioning how it can still remain a unique identity. World-renowned programs that were clearly linked to the strategic mandate of the university, like environmental science, environmental studies, ecology, and restoration biology, were closed. For context, Laurentian University was instrumental in the regreening efforts in Sudbury that transformed the city from a barren area to a rehabilitated, beautiful, green, and thriving area. In addition, Laurentian ended its relationship with three federated colleges that no longer grant that can no longer grant degrees. As of May 1st, students can no longer take courses at these institutions, three of which are on the same property as Laurentian. Huntington University has sold their gerontology courses to Laurentian and plans to become independent. The University of Sudbury is also looking into becoming an independent Francophone institution. The future of Indigenous studies is uncertain as there are conflicting media reports about what is happening with those. On the screen are the Indigenous professors who were once employed by Laurentian University and remain on the Laurentian University website as of today. While I do not know how many of them remain employed at Laurentian University, several appear to be affiliated with the Federated University of Sudbury or other departments that were terminated. Laurentian doesn't have its own Indigenous Studies department. University of Sudbury professors teach Laurentian students, and that agreement was severed by Laurentian. The affidavit indicates that Laurentian University will continue to engage with the Indigenous community, news of which is questionable by some of these people in reports. Okufa indicates that as part of the CCAA process, the Indigenous Studies Department, its programs, and its faculty have been terminated. For students, this means the loss of Indigenous-centered, Indigenous-developed, and Indigenous-run degree programs. For the surrounding region, this means the loss of Indigenous leadership and educational opportunities for First Nations youth and an important educational hub. There are claims that this action by Laurentian University violates and undermines the truth and reconciliation efforts made over the years by the university. Indigenous studies was one example of something that remained unique to Laurentian. Every aspect of what made Laurentian unique, its Indigenous character, the Francophone programs, all of that stuff is just gone, according to this professor. Citizens in the North are deeply concerned about the shocking cuts being made. Access to education and other resources is a constant struggle for people living in the North, in part because of a lower population density. The closures do not make sense to the public, since, as underlined on the screen, programs that operate at capacity were cut. The cuts that were made are going to have ongoing devastating impacts on the university, the city's economy, and everything that makes the city worth living in. It is a concern for access to post-secondary education, which as we know is a determinant of health, and some of these cuts are being questioned as severely short-sighted by the public. In small communities, the community has a strong reliance on institutions like Laurentian University for economic stability. According to the 2016 Census by Statistics Canada, Sudbury was the only Northern Ontario major city to see a growth in its population between 2000 and 2015. The jobs provided by Laurentian University and opportunities to engage in education are a major part of what brings people to the North and keeps them there. According to the Laurentian University strategic mandate, 52% of enrolled students are first-generation post-secondary students, 65% of Laurentian alumni reside in Northern Ontario after graduation. Since 2009, there's been a 9% increase in Indigenous student enrollment. And again, since 2009, there's been a 6% increase in Francophone student enrollment. The government needs to address the root causes of this problem to prevent it from happening again or elsewhere. Sudbarians are also calling for transparency in how decisions are being made and for some of the program cuts to be reversed. Removing access to some of these programs ultimately means that some students will be unable to pursue the education they desire. 
Despite an overall growth in its population between 2000 and 2015, as the chart on your screen shows, our population is aging. A 2020 report examining population growth estimated that we need to attract significant numbers of people to the north just to maintain a healthy ratio of workers to dependents. An aging population is a common concern across Ontario and is not unique to Laurentian University. Declining enrollment is cited by several news reports as a factor in the decision to declare insolvency. Data from the Ministry of Advanced Education and Skills Development shows that enrollments at Laurentian University peaked in 2015, but when comparing 2012 to 2018, there was a slight increase. These numbers are significantly better than other northern institutions. Enrollment was also impacted in 2016 by the closure of a campus in Barrie. According to the letter from former Board of Governors, competition at its Barrie campus was enormously impacted by the decision to allow Lakehead University to construct a campus in Orillia. In addition, Laurentian's own efforts to expand in the Barrie area were stopped by the Ministry. In 2016, Laurentian University made a difficult decision to close the Barrie campus after 15 years, which cost them $10.1 million in debt. Although none of the news reports have commented on the impact of future competition within the city, it is anticipated that ongoing competition will be a challenge for post-secondary institutions, especially in light of the recent announcements that the number of institutions may increase as partners of Laurentian University seek independence. Sudbury is situated in Northern Ontario and has three post-secondary institutions who currently have strong research and program partnerships. Sudburyans feel that Laurentian University plays a major role in attracting people to the North, which is true, but so do the two colleges. These institutions need to continue to work together to meet the needs of the community. Across Ontario, universities are subject to the same funding model and oversight. In Canada, colleges and universities receive close to three quarters of their funding from the government and tuition fees. Over time, the proportion of provincial funding has been slowly declining while tuition fees are making up an increasing portion of the revenue. As shown in this chart, Laurentian fell behind the rest of the province in the proportion of their revenue generated from tuition dollars. Instead, they were generating a significant portion of their revenue from research funding. The latest data from Statistics Canada shows that for tuition fees, one-third of tuition is from international students who pay a higher tuition than domestic students. Diversifying campuses comes with many benefits. However, relying on international tuition dollars is risky business for all post-secondary institutions. In a letter to Shelley Tapp, former Board of Governors cite the 2017 withdrawal of Saudi students over a foreign policy dispute as a major factor impacting their finances. Compared to other universities, however, Laurentian University does not recruit or rely on international student tuition dollars as much as other institutions. Institutions that budget based on unpredictable international student enrollment are at risk for external events like the pandemic or tenuous relationships between countries impacting their ability to repay debt. Some argue that institutions should be actively recruiting international students to remain financially viable while others find that ethically and morally challenging. Historically, enrollment dictated funding and performance accounted for 1.4% of funds received. The way universities are funded is already scheduled to change to a performance-based model. The new funding model will base institutional funding on 10 key performance outcomes that are designed to improve the accountability of institutions in relation to meeting economic and labor market outcomes. This change was postponed to 2022 because of the pandemic. Laurentian performs well in many of these areas. However, several of the university's cuts were to programs that are part of the strength and focus metric of this new funding model. In particular, many French and Indigenous programs have been cut. Part of what costs more is being bilingual. Laurentian spends $2,000 more to educate each student than the Ontario average. This new model has been criticized by the NDP and faculty associations for making budgets less predictable. It is unclear if this model will work for all sizes of universities. Former Laurentian Board of Governors argue that new buildings over the last 10 years were urgently needed and supported by loans, government partners, and student representatives. No long-term debt was acquired in the construction of some of these buildings, 
However, others relied on ongoing revenue that was cut due to the withdrawal of international students and changes to domestic tuition rates. Laurentian University has a comparatively low tuition rate compared to other universities in the province. In 2019, tuition was cut and it was frozen in 2020. The former Board of Governors, in a letter uh, to Shelley Tapp, say that that equates to about 16% reduction in only two years. Faculty salaries at Laurentian University are high, and there was an attempt in 2017 to reduce staff by offering them incentives to leave their jobs. Faculty contracts make it difficult for Laurentian University to reduce this cost, which is now being done outside of the collective bargaining process. There is currently a lack of transparency around exactly how much Laurentian University spends on salaries, but by 2022, the government will require institutions to post aggregated data about faculty compensation and faculty work activities on their website, which will improve transparency later. Laurentian University has claimed that the processes that they used in order to carry debt from uh, when tuition comes in to the next line of tuition is common across institutions. It is well known that Laurentian University was carrying debt. Laurentian University has claimed that the way they manage their debt by carrying a loan between tuition installments is common practice at universities. The problem is that the deficits were not accurately reported. From 2017 till now, there has been refusal of Laurentian University to share financial information requested by the union during their contract negotiations. Laurentian University has been hiding just how bad the debt was. At some point, there was a dangerous decision that was made to combine restricted funds with unrestricted funds, which essentially meant that the university was using money for operational costs that should have been reserved for other purposes. Since Laurentian University declared its insolvency, other northern institutions have come forward with statements that their budgets are balanced. The university has been saying for a long time that it has way too many small enrollment courses and programs. Part of that is, again, because they offer programs both in English and French, which has raised the school's per student costs, also raising staffing costs and overhead for the university. While the university has tried to restructure in the past, the former Board of Governors says that it's a slow process and decisions can't be made in the same way at a bilingual mandated university as they would be in other large universities. The Government of Ontario has provided financial help to several institutions that were impacted by the pandemic. Laurentian University was not among them. Many people are questioning why the only institution undergoing insolvency was excluded from this funding. According to an email statement, Romano felt that at this time, a one-time injection of funding through the COVID-19 support fund is not going to fix the significant long-term and systematic challenges faced by Laurentian University. Romano has appointed an advisor to help make decisions about how to respond to Laurentian University's insolvency. On April 19th, Bill C-288 was presented to the House of Commons to amend the CCAA and exclude publicly funded institutions from this process in the future. According to an insolvency expert with Fontaine and Associates here in Sudbury, an alternative process would be needed if this legislation passes because institutions need some way to stop them from going bankrupt. There are a lot of questions around how the financial situation got this bad and if there was some negligence or mismanagement on the part of the university. An audit is scheduled through the Ontario Auditor General's office, which will hopefully get some unbiased answers. The PC government introduced some legislation recently to make the Northern Ontario School of Medicine and Hearst University independent which also causes a problem for Lakehead University because they were reportedly not informed of these changes and are affiliated with NOSM as well. There are many, many unanswered questions. And again, the situation is rapidly evolving. I'm anxious to find out if funds were mismanaged and if they were, how come this mismanagement was allowed to continue? 
I have questions around if there should be a limit on the amount of financial risks acceptable at institutions like this, what a better process would look like for restructuring when it is needed, and is there enough transparency and accountability in the new funding model? Hospitals have a process for dealing with poor financial decisions and uh, someone from the government can come in and help with the restructuring process. There are some questions around whether that type of process might be appropriate in a university context. Thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any comments, um, please feel free to leave them below. Again, I do not have all the answers and all of the information in this video is based on a variety of news sources and publicly available information, which again, one of the problems is that that information is incomplete.